again guys and welcome back. In this lecture video, we will look at the conditions for spontaneity and derive two more state functions for the criteria of spontaneity. Okay, to start off, recall our criteria for spontaneity for an isolated system is that we could use entropy change for the system alone as a basis. You should be very familiar with this expression at this point. If the entropy is greater than zero, then it is an irreversible spontaneous process. If it is equal to zero, then it is a reversible spontaneous process. And if the entropy of the system is less than zero, then it is a non-spontaneous process. Now, it will be very easy if we just deal with the system, but this is not the case. Most of the system that we will be dealing involves non-isolated systems. So if we are dealing with non-isolated systems, our criteria for spontaneity is the entropy change of the entire universe. Now, in order to calculate this, we need to calculate the entropy change of the system and the entropy change in the surroundings, which of course is not very convenient. Again, we define the system as part of the universe that we are interested in studying and the surroundings as everything else. So, it is not very convenient to calculate the entropy change of the surroundings as well if we are just interested in determining the spontaneity of the processes involved in our system. Alright, so as I have said previously, our aim in this lecture video is to establish alternative criterion for spontaneity. That is, we will express the second law of thermodynamics in other state functions at convenient conditions. So what do I mean when I say convenient conditions? These are conditions that we can easily establish in the laboratory, such as, for example, constant temperature, constant pressure, and constant volume. Now take note for constant volume, we can use a bump calorimeter to establish constant volume conditions. Let's look back at entropy as a criteria for spontaneity. Recall if we just use entropy of system as a criteria, it only applies to isolated systems. So overall, we know that the ds for an isolated system must be greater than or equal to zero for spontaneous process. So what is exactly an isolated system? What is being kept constant? All right, so for an isolated system, there is no exchange of energy with the surroundings, meaning the dq net of our process is zero and the dw net is also zero. All right, so based from the first law of thermodynamics, since du is equal to dq plus dw, since all of these terms is zero, this means that the change in the internal energy is equal to zero. Hence, for an isolated system, internal energy is constant. Okay, if we have a system that involves PV work or pressure volume work, DW is defined as negative P external dV. Since DW is zero, this also implies that the change in the volume or dV is equal to zero as well. So these are the parameters that remain constant in an isolated system, constant internal energy and constant volume. In general, at constant volume and internal energy, the change of entropy is a criteria for spontaneity. For spontaneous processes, the change in the entropy or ds at constant internal energy and constant volume must be greater than or equal to zero. Again, this is for our system. Take note that this is an inconvenient equation because it is very hard to establish a constant internal energy in the laboratory. Now let's look at a more generalized criteria for spontaneity, which is the Clausius inequality. In your textbook, the Clausius inequality is written as this equation. I will rearrange this into this alternative expression. I will use this as a basis to derive for other state functions that we could use to determine if our process is spontaneous or not. Overall, dq over t must be less than or equal to ds or the change in entropy for a permissible process. I could write this equation now as dq over t minus ds is less than or equal to zero. I will then multiply this entire equation by a temperature T, which will give me this equation. dq minus T ds is less than or equal to zero. Okay, so let's recall the first law of thermodynamics. du is equal to dq plus dw. 
if we have the system that involves PV work, DU is equal to DQ minus PPV. Then we can rearrange this equation as DQ is equal to DU plus PDV. So let us replace this term for DQ and we write DU plus PDV minus PDS is less than or equal to zero for spontaneous processes. Now, this is an alternative form of the Clausius inequality. This is the general criteria for spontaneity. Now, let us establish some conditions that are to be held constant. that set constant volume and constant entropy. Then dV and dS will be both equal to zero in this equation. Ultimately, we will be left with dU at constant volume and entropy is less than or equal to zero for a spontaneous process. This equation tells us that for any system with constant volume and entropy, a spontaneous process is in which the change in the internal energy is going to be less than or equal to zero. Take note again that these conditions are not very convenient because it is not very easy to establish a constant entropy in the laboratory. All right, so let's use enthalpy as a basis for the criteria of spontaneity. The general expression for enthalpy is H is equal to U plus PV. If we differentiate this equation, this will give us DH is equal to DU plus PDV plus VDP. Take note that I've used the product rule for the PV term. I can rewrite this equation as DH minus VDP is equal to DU plus PDV. We will see this in a while why I did this step. Now, let's recall that the general expression for the Clausius inequality is that DU plus PDV minus PDS is less than or equal to zero for a spontaneous process. Okay, I can now substitute the DU plus PDV to the Clausius inequality to give me DH minus VDP minus TDS is less than or equal to zero. Now, this equation is an alternative statement for the Clausius inequality in terms of enthalpy and changes in pressure. Okay, so just like what we did earlier, let's establish some constant condition. Let's say change in pressure and change in entropy are constants. Then the terms containing dp and ds in our equation will become zero. Thus, the final equation becomes dh at constant pressure and entropy is less than or equal to zero for a spontaneous process. Again, this equation can be an alternative criteria for spontaneity. However, it is not easy to establish constant entropy and it makes this expression very inconvenient. All right, so we have to look for alternative expressions to establish more convenient criteria for spontaneity. At this point, we cannot rely on the current state functions that we discuss, such as internal energy, entropy, and enthalpy, as a basis of convenient criteria for spontaneity. This means that we have to define new state functions. I will now introduce a new state function, which we define as A. That is, A is equal to U minus TS. When we get the differential of this equation, we have DA is equal to DU minus TDS minus SDT. Now, let's recall our alternative form of the Clausius inequality, which is DU plus PDV minus TDS is less than or equal to zero for a spontaneous process. We can see that some terms are similar to our differential of A, which I have highlighted in red. So now I can write this as dA plus SDT is equal to du minus T dS. I can write the Clausius inequality as dA plus SDT plus PDV is less than or equal to zero. As we did previously, let us establish constant conditions, let's say constant temperature and constant volume. Now, the, these terms in the equations will become zero. Ultimately, dA at constant temperature and volume is less than or equal to zero for a spontaneous process. In this equation, we have now convenient conditions that can be held constant. It is easy to achieve constant temperature in the laboratory and constant volume can be carried out using bump calorimeters. This new state function is known as the Helmholtz energy, uh, which is given 
by the symbol capital letter A. Now, the change in Helmholtz energy has to decrease for a spontaneous process as shown in this equation. All right, so let's now define a new state function, and let's call this one as G. And this is equal to the enthalpy minus temperature times the entropy. Just like what we did earlier, let us take the differential of this equation. So this will be dg is equal to dh minus tds minus sdt. Now, if you notice, our dg equation contains an enthalpy term. Hence, I will use an alternative form of closest inequality involving an enthalpy term that we have derived earlier. That is, dh minus vdp minus tds is less than or equal to zero. Now, notice that some terms in the Clausius inequality and in the DG equation are similar as shown in red. I can now write the DG equation as DG plus SDP is equal to DH minus TDS. All right, so substituting DH minus TDS to the Clausius inequality will lead us to DG plus SDP minus VDP is less than or equal to zero for a spontaneous process. Now, using this equation, we can establish some constant conditions as we did earlier, such as constant temperature and constant pressure. It will be apparent that these terms will become zero, and ultimately, dg at constant pressure and temperature is less than or equal to zero for spontaneous processes. This new state function is called the Gibbs free energy, and it is denoted by the capital letter G. Now, this criteria for spontaneity at constant pressure and temperature is very convenient. Take note that the constant pressure and temperatures are easily established inside the laboratory. Similar to Helmholtz energy, for spontaneous processes, the change in Gibbs free energy must be decreasing. Let us now summarize the different criteria for spontaneity. Let us look again at entropy. For spontaneous processes, the entropy of the universe is increasing. The equilibrium state corresponds to when entropy change is zero, and for non-spontaneous processes, this corresponds to the negative entropy change in the universe. In other words, for spontaneous processes, they are going to a state that maximizes the entropy of the universe. Now, the equilibrium state corresponds to the maximum state as shown in this figure. For our two other state functions, such as Helmholtz energy and Gibbs free energy, for both cases, we have the opposite. For spontaneous processes, the change in Helmholtz or Gibbs free energy must be negative overall. Remember that for spontaneous processes, it tends to go to a minimum as shown in this figure. Now, the equilibrium state corresponds when our Helmholtz energy and Gibbs free energy is at our minimum. Okay, so these are the summary for the different criteria for spontaneity. Let us now understand the physical significance of the Helmholtz energy. Let us start with the first law of thermodynamics. We can write it as dQ is equal to dQ plus dW. Okay, guys, remember that for dQ and dW, they involve an inexact differential. So if we isolate the dQ term, we have this equation. dQ is equal to dU minus dW. Again, we recall our generalized Clausius inequality as shown in this equation. I can rewrite this as dS is greater than or equal to dQ over T. Now, I can put the temperature on the other side of the equation to give me TBS is greater than or equal to dQ. All right, so let us now replace the first law expression into TBS is greater than or equal to dU minus dW. Upon rearranging this equation, we have dW is greater than or equal to dU minus TBS. Recall again in our derivations that du minus tbs is going to be equivalent to da plus sdt. Hence, our equation becomes dw is greater than or equal to da plus sdt. Under isothermal conditions where the change in temperature dt is equal to zero, then dw has to be greater than or equal to da. 
upon integration of this expression, we have delta A or the change in Helmholtz energy is less than or equal to A. Now, what does this mean? Recall again that if our system is doing work, this work term is a negative value. This means that work here is the work done by the system. This is, equation tells us that delta A is the lowest possible value of work that the system can do. But since work done on the system is a negative value, this expression means that delta A is the maximum work that the system can do on the surroundings. So again, Helmholtz energy just represents the maximum work that the system can do on the surroundings. All right, let's now discuss the physical significance of the Gibbs free energy. Let us start by recalling again the first law of thermodynamics, which is given by this equation. At this point, we have to extend the definition of work. We can split DW into pressure volume work or PV work and non-PV work. Okay, so when I mean non-PV work, this work includes electrical work, chemical work, mechanical work, etc. Our extended expression of the first law now becomes du is equal to dq plus dw pv plus dw non pv. Recall from our earlier definition for pv work, this is just equivalent to the negative pdv. Okay, so now let us isolate the dq term and do some rearrangements. So this will give us dq is equal to du plus pdv minus dw non pv. Now, let us again recall our clauses inequality and the rearrangements that we have carried out with this equation. Substituting the dq equation to the TDS expression will give us TDS is greater than or equal to du plus PV minus DW non-PV. Isolating the DW non-PV will give us DW non-PV is greater than or equal to du plus PDV minus TDS. Okay, so at this point, you should notice that du plus pdv is equal to the differential form of our enthalpy. Therefore, this equation becomes dw non-pv is greater than or equal to dh minus tds. From our previous discussions, we know that dh minus tds can be written as dg plus sdt. Thus, the equation becomes dw non-pv is greater than or equal to dg plus sdt. If we establish a constant temperature condition that is dt is equal to zero, then sdt term becomes zero and the final equation becomes this. dw non-pv is greater than or equal to dg. Integrating this final equation will give us Delta G, or the change in Gibbs free energy, is less than or equal to the non-PV work done by the system. So this Gibbs free energy represents the maximum non-PV work that the system can do. That is why we call this one as the free energy. In other words, Delta G is the energy that is free to do non-PV work, such as chemical or electrical work. All right, so let's summarize the two new state functions that we have derived. So Helmholtz energy represents the maximum overall work that the system can do, whereas Gibbs free energy represents the maximum non-PV work. For definitions, we have A is equal to U minus TS for Helmholtz energy, and G is equal to H minus TS for Gibbs free energy. The corresponding differentials of these equations are also shown in this slide. At isothermal conditions, these equations will become dA is equal to du minus tds for Helmholtz energy and dg is equal to dH minus tds for Gibbs free energy. Notice that in both equations, we have a tds term. Now, this represents the energy that is tied up to the random molecular energy states. We can look at this term as the amount of energy that is unavailable to perform work. You can th also think of this term as the amount of energy that we need to subtract when we are trying to figure out or to calculate how much the maximum work that the system can do. Okay, so let's look closely at Gibbs free energy. As we all know by now, the equation is given as G is equal to H minus TS. 
in writing the differential form of this equation, we have dg is equal to dh minus tds minus sdt. Oftentimes, we were just interested in isothermal conditions, that is dp is equal to zero. So the equation becomes dg is equal to dh minus tds. Now, integrating this equation from the initial and final states of Gibbs free energy gives us delta H minus P delta S. This is a well-known equation in thermodynamics because it defines Gibbs free energy from the enthalpy change and the entropy change of processes. This table shows us a summary of how the signs of delta H and delta S for a given reaction determines the reaction spontaneity. Take note that for the reaction to be spontaneous, delta G must be negative. Now, I suggest that you spend some time to analyze this table. We have just some things to remember. At low temperatures, the sign of the delta G is determined by the sign of delta H. However, at high temperature, since temperature appears in the term minus T delta S, this term becomes a dominant factor in the calculation. Gibbs free energy, like the other thermodynamic functions, as we have discussed, is a state function. The value of the delta G for the process depends only on the final and initial states of the system and not upon the path taken between those states. So we can use this equation to calculate for the delta G of the reaction. All right, so let's try to calculate the standard Gibbs free energy for the reaction wherein one mole of carbon monoxide gas reacts with half mole of oxygen gas to give you one mole of carbon dioxide, which is a liquid. And the standard Gibbs free energy change is given us the Gibbs free energy of the products minus the Gibbs free energy of the reactants. Again, this is similar to the calculations we did for the standard entropy changes. Again, please remember that we have to include the proper stoichiometric coefficients of the reactants or the products in the calculation. Note that the standard or absolute Gibbs free energy or values were also taken from data tables. Now, evaluating this equation will give us negative 257.2 kilojoules per mole as a change of the Gibbs free energy of the reaction. Remember that when a spontaneous reaction occurs, this free energy of the system declines. All right, so we have already reached the last topic for this video, and thank you very much for listening.